Hello my friends and welcome to Gamers Tell All, an interview series where I talk to other creatives on the YouTube platform who analyze video games to uh, look into some of the games that they found particularly influential and really explore how those games uh, affected their lives. And today I have with me the amazing, the, one, the wonderful, the fantabulous Kaihatsu. Kaihatsu, go ahead and say hello. Hello, how is everyone? <laughs> they can respond. I'm sure you should can. respond in the comments. In, in the comments, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Kaihatsu, how did you get started on YouTube? About how long have you been at it? Well, my first channel started when I was 13. And that was back in 2013. And then that never really went anywhere because obviously when you're, you're 13, you don't really focus <laughs> on making good content. You just kind of focus on making crappy True. videos. And then right. I left it for a while. And then I came back in... 2016 I'm not really sure 100 percent why i started a youtube channel i had one for a while before and i was uploading bits of music remixes that i did on it and then i switched mm. to making educational videos about games and i think one of the the two primary influences for that were the game theorists um and also another <laughs> channel called loxton who um was probably was very influential he ended up talking a lot about pokemon and symbolism of pokemon in mid 2016 and for a while, I had written down a lot of stuff in a notebook because I, I kind of <laughs> noticed a lot of things in Pokemon. Yeah. I thought, wait a second, I better talk about this, otherwise I'm not going to have you know anything to say. So then I just kind of started making videos about culture and games. Although I did start out with actually uh, talking about science and games, but then I kind of moved over into culture because that's more of my uh, mm -hmm. my expertise. So, Correct. And I've been doing that uh, for the past four years, and it's going pretty well. Yeah, culture is really the like one of the big unique points about your channel like um you speak four languages how many languages do you speak yeah okay so a lot of, a lot of people ask me this question so i was born and i grew up in the united arab emirates and i lived there for most of my life so i spent more time outside of the uk than in the uk so right the uae is a very very multicultural society and that it, like the history of the arabian gulf it's always been traders coming in and out and there's a lot of famous mm -hmm. uh, Arabian explorers like Ibn Battuta who went to China and Morocco and Spain. So for a long time, there's been a history of people kind of coalescing in that area. And being there kind of exposed me to so many different cultures and so many different people that it was just so interesting. Like, you know, at school, like we always had an international day where everyone would have they'd come with their parents and they'd set up a little stall with their, their country and some <laughs> items from their country and food and yeah. my parents being Scottish I'd always have to dress up in a kilt and serve people haggis <laughs> but like just finding out about other people it was just really interesting because I think it's strange yeah. coming back to the UK a lot of people like especially like I've I, there was a, a TV show recently in the UK like some people have never met any Asians at all like they just get stuck in communities of of, of native English people and I'm just like I don't know how I could I don't know how anyone could do that like how could anyone not know because there was a joke going around on Twitter from someone clipped a bit of the program where they were a mum and their kid were trying to they were inviting some Muslims over and they were arguing over whether some lettuce was halal or not and you know growing up with halal food it just I it just it was extremely strange and amusing but yeah um, and that kind of mixture of people kind of eventually I, I came back to being like I, I think it's good to inform people I want to talk about this I want to tell people and you know kind of educate people about uh, culture and I think a good way to do that is through games because if, if you look closely enough you can see culture influences games in a whole matter of ways oh left and right every I think it's very common for when a creative is trying to think of a new thing they want to make it's very common to just immediately jump to researching someone's culture uh, just because that's where you can get some of the best inspiration and it's where you can get inspired because there's always something you've not encountered yet that you can draw from. Um, I, I kind of had a similar situation growing up in Omaha, Nebraska of all places because it was it was an Air Force town. Um, you know, there was an Air Force base, and of course, when Air Force, uh, you know, when our airmen, when our soldiers go across the seas and, you know, live on bases far and abroad, they often bring back wives with them <laughs> and uh, they get to making babies. So Omaha became very multicultural, but at the same time, 
it was also very isolated. Like there wasn't a lot of cultural overlap. So、mm. even though, like, even though an entire like you know. An entire community of Japanese, Chinese, Korean, Southeast Asian peoples existed in Omaha.、Mm. I would very frequently meet lots of other white people in my town who only knew one person or didn't even know that there was a good, like a good Chinese food restaurant that wasn't Panda Express. <laughs> like the,、oh, yeah. it was. It was fascinating that everyone was right next door and still did not know anything about each other. Yeah,、um, I think I kind of got away from your question originally, but you're talking about languages. So when I was in the UAE, you have to you have、yes. to learn Arabic. That's part of the the government curriculum, even if you're at an international school. So I was one of the only、uh, people at my school that actually liked enjoying、uh, learning Arabic. Everyone else didn't really seem to enjoy it that much.、Um, but then、no. af- <laughs> after、uh, Getting into secondary school, I continued with Arabic, and then I took up Spanish, which I took up until I started doing university.、Um, and back in two thousand fourteen, as well, I started learning Japanese. So I'm still doing that. So、uh, yeah, that's yeah. that's yeah. I like learning languages. That's a good chunk. That's a good chunk of them.、Um, well, I also speak a little bit of Japanese. So if later on we want to annoy the viewers and、oh. just talk in Japanese <laughs> without subtitles, sure I think I would have a, I would have a lot of fun with that.、Um, but we'll save that for later. Yeah, we'll save that for later.、Uh, so、uh, to the issue of the podcast itself, talking about how games affect change in people's lives.、Uh, What game are we going to be talking about today? Now I had to think about this a lot actually because I wasn't really sure what I wanted to talk about. But I think in the end, it's probably going to be Minecraft. Minecraft. Yes, Minecraft.、Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Dirty, dirty little secret. I have never played Minecraft. Really? I've gone. I've gone this long, and I've still not played it. I have. I had friends who played it in college. And I have watched kids play it, and I have watched YouTubers play it, and I've watched the YouTubers that were actively not playing it play it. I have not played it. I have a big appreciation for what it looks to be doing, but I have no experience of it myself. Yeah, I kind of dipped in and out of it because it, you kind of play it for so long and then you get tired of it. But I, I think you're, you're missing out. It's, it's a good thing to try at least <laughs> once. Like, I'm I, not a big fan、yeah. of Fortnite, but even I've I've played Fortnite once, you know, and that was kind of when I decided, yeah, this this isn't my thing. But I think it's good to try even once and just see what it's all about.、Um, it's definitely on. It's definitely like a big glaring、uh, blank spot on my list.、Um, so, what?、Um, What is the most significant thing,、uh, or the significant thing that、uh, you have that Minecraft was able to teach while you played it? I think this is kind of—it's not something that the game inherently—I don't know—that it teaches. But I'm just trying to—I'm thinking about this more from a game design perspective because I—I、uh-huh. I, that's why I go to to college for. So I kind of was thinking about it, and I just came to the realization one day when playing it. I was just aimlessly walking around in one of the. Many worlds that I ended up making, and I just thought, like, there really, there's no point to any of this. And I think the main、mm. thing that I realized from Minecraft is that games don't really need to have any kind of point to them, because they they can just be games. You play them because they're fun. And Minecraft is a game where you can do anything, pretty much. There's people that make computers. I don't know how the hell they do that, but they make computers <laughs> in Minecraft. There's people that use、yeah. it as an art form. And then you get people like me that just I don't know sometimes escape to it for a little while and make a little farm and you know kind of a very zen experience, but it kind of it made me think back to something my dad told me back in the eighties.、Uh, he was never into games. He was born way before games really became a thing. But one of his friends brought a Game Boy and showed him Tetris on the Game Boy, and he played it for a little bit. And he just said to me, he didn't really understand the whole point of it. Like he just said, oh, it's It's a kind of a waste of time. You just create blocks,、huh. and then everything you'd line them up, and they all disappear. And I said, "Well, does it? it it's fun, you know.、It、doesn't really have to have much of a higher purpose than、yeah. you know passing a little bit of time." 
I mean, I think it was one of the... Was it Gunpei Yokoi that made the Game Boy? I think he said he was on a, a train in Japan when he noticed a businessman playing with a calculator. And I said, that's it's pretty much analogous to that. You, it's just something to pass the time, but it can be amusing. A lot of games do have a higher message, but some of them, like Minecraft, are just something you mess around in for a while and spend the time with some friends, or you can build giant monuments, or you can blow things up. It's entirely up to you. Right. Um, that, I mean, it is an interesting point because Minecraft has, like it always, when I worked at GameStop, because of course I did, uh, <laughs> and we would sell Minecraft to people, the line that we were always told to use was, this is digital Legos. It's just a world where everything is a Lego mm. and your kids can play with all these blocks and turn them into really cool big things and that's how we were supposed to sell minecraft to the parents that came in saying i've heard about this minecraft and i what don't is know my kid what wants? is it <laughs> uh and what do i need to buy so that they can play minecraft um of course now it's fortnite which yeah. i guess has <laughs> building in it but <laughs> the mm, it's very different the um well then because it is analogous to like uh, most games i would say uh before video games became a thing that was seen as a medium for telling new and different ways of engaging with story and therefore different ways of engaging with meaning um i would say most games kind of didn't have a point to them. Uh, they were often just for fun, like a set of rules to play around with to pass the time. Yeah, like, that's true. I mean, um, I think I think on some level these days people get too caught up in, like, games need to have a message. They need to be, you know, philosophical or political or whatever. And mm -hmm. it's true, you can. It's perfectly reasonable but i think sometimes people forget that the main reason people played games to begin with is because they're you know they're fun that's why I, I think that i think pe it's good to tell people remind them once in a while that you know doesn't need to have a point you can play it just because you want to you know because so, some people say like oh you, know, you know why do you want to play this like my dad back in the 80s why do you want to play tetris you know just <laughs> everything disappears like I don't know. Yeah. Like nowadays, I still play Tetris every time I go on a train because I travel on trains quite a lot. I just, you know, pass the time because I'm just sitting there. I may as well play some Tetris. Mm -hmm. You know, it... absolutely. I find it odd that um, that he didn't find Tetris like immediately engaging because Tetris kind of has that reputation, right, of being entertaining, like of it feeling good on like a visceral core level that there's yeah. just something about how four blocks fit together and then become complete that appeals to the human lizard brain that fires yeah. off the endorphins i don't know i think he just kind of thought that it was just a way of frittering away time but again it is but mm. it, it yeah you know i'm not really sure i mean when he first started working in computers were massive things that took up rooms and you had to put in a punch card and wait a couple of days for it to come back with right. its response. So I don't know, I think <laughs> on some level he, he just thinks that, well, it's, can, can I make spreadsheets on this Game Boy thing? Because otherwise there's no point. Well, what's the point? Because <laughs> I think to him, I think it logically he's a very pragmatic person. I think logically to him he doesn't really get the point of making something like this which doesn't have any kind of utility. Mm -hmm. a point so to speak yeah well at least not a at least not a pre-designed yeah. utility or point um and i guess that's really the key fact that makes minecraft stand out even among the other um player creator type games uh you know we've there's been some copycats, like uh, Terraria, I think, yeah. was the 2D one that came out that people were talking about. Um, and then, of course, most recently, Dreams just came out, and that game it's is a, essentially not a game. It's, it's essentially an engine and, and a, and a game-making tool that is not inherently a game when you get it. They're just some yeah. games that have already been made. I was joking to someone the other day saying, oh, the developers have developed a game that's going to put them out of their own job. 
<laughs> uh, except they're at least using it as a uh, it's it's a game that is a big commercial for their engine to get that, other yeah. people to buy it but so that the they things can that people sell doing that is crazy but again it's you can see the parallels between that and something like minecraft it's yeah so in in minecraft it's because there are well i mean there did become a story mode and an end of the game for people to actually pursue and get to um it's but it's loose. really yeah uh i mean you know matt pat on the game theorist has made tons of minecraft lore videos now because mm. of how popular uh, because of its <laughs> resurgence this last year uh so you know you gotta you gotta milk that algorithm yeah, you when do. you can um so absolutely no hate for that uh but the uh, i guess the thing about minecraft is that since it is i mean it's kind of just a space for play and since like you said there's no point there's no real goals um what players have to make up their own goals as they go along you know i kind of remember doing similar things when playing like Tony Hawk's Underground Skater 2 as a kid, where my friends and I would be on the couch and be like, try to do this, that, and the other thing, or get up there, and like yeah. just come up with all these random things that weren't in the games to actually try to do. And uh, to a certain extent, Minecraft as a space for play feels also like a space where, because there's no point, any player can define their own point for what they're actually want to accomplish it, it during gives you any that given freedom setting. to choose what to do right. which i think a lot of people i think this, a while back the game theorists it was a long time ago now probably but they mm -hmm. made a video talking about why people play games and one of those reasons is the the freedom that it gives you to choose what to do to have that mm -hmm. control that agency that people might not necessarily have in many aspects of their own lives so right. Minecraft is one of those games that lets you do anything. I mean, especially when, when you consider in all the other mods that people make for them, if you so wish you could like go to the moon or build a massive factory <laughs> or you could just live out a simple life in a village. It's, the possibilities are endless. <laughs> right. And it's um and it makes it and it's not inconvenient to try to get to those possibilities because all the systems are already in place. Yeah. Uh is there, as someone who has actually played the game, <laughs> is there uh, something, what sort of things about Minecraft actually encourage the player to engage with all of those options and uh, all those possibilities? Because like, if it were just um, an empty room that said, here you can do anything, I imagine it would be very much like uh, Gary's mod or yeah, where you're those kind of like more... flash games where you just drop in the item and see what happens. Yeah. But people are motivated to do a lot more with Minecraft. So what sort of things motivates you as you're playing to want to make a goal? I think, well, thinking back to when I first saw someone play Minecraft, the first thing I remember was just kind of this curiosity you're plopped into this just blank slate of a world but you know there's trees and animals and you know you get little directions from the game to you know punch a tree or open your inventory or whatever mm -hmm. and then i think to begin with there isn't very much you you kind of i mean i suppose it depends on how you get introduced to minecraft but i was introduced through a friend so you know he would tell me oh this is this is what you do you go and punch a tree and then you gotcha. build your house and then you start with that and then you you have your house and you think well what do i do now and then you just kind of think, well, if this is my house, you know, and I have all this stuff, what should I do? And then you think, well, I could add a second story. I, at one point, I I built a giant mansion just because I could on top of a hill. There's not really... Mm -hmm. a, I can't say there's really... It's not like a lot of games where, like, you know, if you're in a shooter, for example, the, the level design is designed in such a way that you're kind of railed into to going a certain way and funneled into going a certain way with mm -hmm. minecraft there's a lot more openness and i think it does it's like lego it depends um it's like one of those lego sets you would get that's just like all the, the bits mixed in together 
and you just have to, you know, I think it's, it's probably easier when you're a kid, but you just kind of think, oh, I'll just build some, some random structure. What, a, what do I build today? Um, I actually, I think that's the, the whole openness of Minecraft is making me struggle to come up with one definitive thing that, you know, <laughs> kind of says. Obviously, there's the goal of getting to the end, but you really don't... Right. You, you really don't think about that when you're starting out. I think it is just the, the first thing is the survival, you know. That's your kind of first goal, and then you kind of branch out from there. I think in a way, you probably in that sense could compare it to... Um, I'm sure there's a name for this, I can't remember off the top of my head, but kind of when you look at a human, you just plop a, a human out in the mm -hmm. wild expanse of the world. What are the first things they need to survive? And then you have your food, your water, your shelter, and then you kind of go from there, and then you kind of build it up to being able to do other things. And I think Minecraft is kind of like that. What do you need, and then what do you want, and then what could you make? So, right. yeah. Um, it sounds like you're describing Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yes, that's what it is. That's what I'm thinking <laughs> Yay, of. Yay, I have philosophy terminology. Yeah, I, I, I knew it was something like that. psychology like, borrows from philosophy. Yeah, all these... <laughs> terms escape me i probably should have written it down somewhere before i started hey that's my job don't worry about it <laughs> um i i mean yeah i guess like i would have gone into this saying that oh well the survive the original mode the survival mode is more limiting uh you know maybe this isn't the definitive thing that motivates the player to make goals but at least a thing is that uh i would say that because the survival mode was so limiting and the creative mode is just there for you to use yeah. and it's Legos, so why not go play with your Legos rather than being told when you can play with your Legos. Um, the <laughs> Maybe that survival mode actually is important to get people thinking along those lines because when you are forced to think about what you need to do, and then you get that satisfied. There's something innate about the human psychology that then says, oh, okay, I have what I need. Now I get to do what I want. Yeah. I um, think the constraints force people to be more uh, kind of creative. And then, like you said at the end, uh, I think the constraints are what leads to that sense of satisfaction. I mean, I enjoy playing in creative a lot. And actually, a lot of the time, I play more creative Minecraft than I do survival. But the problem mm -hmm. with the creative is while you do have all these options, it does lead to kind of a feeling of emptiness and, and unsatisfac uh, unsatisfaction sometimes because you're just like, well, you know, there's not really any... Like, when, when you build something in survival, there is that sense of accomplishment uh, that you've built something, and it takes a lot more work. And again, like, being in those constraints just, I think, makes it feel more rewarding than just being able to place down any block at once. I mean, obviously, right. you can build fantastic structures and creative, but some, some I've seen some of the things that people build in survival, and it's, it is, it's just almost like, I suppose you compare to some of the things that people build in real life, it takes forever to build these massive structures and the amount of work that goes into it, you know. And that inherently makes it impressive because yeah. you know, because you have a frame of reference yeah. for how much, how difficult it was you understand how amazing it is. Yeah. Like, if a you person were to do the is... same thing in creative, then yeah, it would... You'd say, well, you can place whatever blocks you want. You can fly. What, where's the achievement? But it took some time, but... You nothing know, compared that's to all it survival, took. yeah. Right. It's like, uh, it's like when you try to get a small child, like five or six, interested in architecture. <laughs> they have no concept of what it takes to build things. Yeah. And, but, you know, you get a little older, you've had to do a little bit of manual labor, and then you realize, oh my gosh, it took manual labor to build the pyramids. You get a huge appreciation. That took a lot. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, but yeah, that point of the, uh, the constraints, the um, necessity is the mother of innovation. Um, until you don't have any necessity, then it's boredom is the mother of innovation, yeah. <laughs> convenience. Um, and so like you get all of those, all of those motivating factors in their natural order, sort of, uh, so to speak, when you play the game. Um, I know the bit that most intrigued me about uh, Minecraft was 
when I saw that someone punched the tree and the block disappeared and then the tree was just still there. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't fall. It just floats, it floats in the air. And it's like, huh. And here's the thing. What that really reminded me of was Catherine. Because um, that I don't know if you're familiar with the puzzle game Catherine. I've not heard of it before, no. It is kind of infamous. Um, it's an Atlas game, so the same people as Persona, oh. uh, where they just took a break from the Persona series and Shin Megami Tensei and made a puzzle game. Um, and it is a, it's a psychosexual horror game. <laughs> where you are in one point uh, learning about uh, your values when it comes to romantic relationships in a compromising scenario and in another point dealing with a uh, horrible magical curse that no one really understands but it requires you to climb a tower of blocks uh, and the blocks suspend themselves on edges but they don't need any support from below, mm. which allows you to make all of these different shapes and staircases and different combinations in order to ascend higher. And then the blocks start taking on different properties, so you have to engage with them differently uh, so that they don't kill you, specifically. Mm. Um, but when I played that game, there was a lot of my downtime, my not in playing the game time where I was just imagining the movement of blocks, blocks, blocks in a, um, in almost in like an abstract, non-specific way, like not a productive way, just generally feeling how it moved in my head and somehow feeling that that abstract thinking about it was helping me come up with new solutions to how to keep progressing through the puzzle game. Mm. Um, but if you get the chance, play it, uh, because it is a trip. It um, sounds very interesting, for sure. It's, it, is, uh, it is one of my two favorite games of all time, and it is weird, and it is uh, some, somewhat too very raunchy, <laughs> and like it, it kind of impresses me that it didn't get an A rating. It was very, it, it skirted that line, but it also had some controversy because of its um, because of its difficulty. In that it was known as the most difficult game released on the PlayStation Three, mm -hmm. and the North America release did not get the hardest difficulty on its original release because they thought the North Americans wouldn't like that. Uh, that always seems no, to be because... the case with the North Americans. They always dumb down the <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. There was actually an easy mode created for North America and the hard mode taken away. So the North Americans that actually wanted to play the game were like, no, give me the hard mode. <laughs> um, but they thought that because, you know, the North American game design at the time was all about don't create a an experience that's too hard, make sure that uh, the player gets to see everything because they paid for it, that sort of, you know... You gotta um, hold their hand along the way. Yeah, that mentality. The one that, uh, like, really, Catherine and Dark Souls, Demon Souls, were raging against that concept yeah. right at about the same time. So in my head, there's a universe in which Catherine became as popular as Dark Souls and Dark Souls didn't take off. So... I don't know what that world would have looked like. Uh, but, um, but yeah, when Minecraft showed me that, it was like, wait, blocks just suspend in air. Physics mean nothing. So I can make what, you know, you can do whatever you want with that. Reality is what I make it. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, uh, the, you know, a solipsist stream is what Minecraft is. Um, yeah. So, uh, I don't know, is there, is there anything else that the game does to, um, to motivate players to start making their own goals in that play space? Hmm. Let me think for a second. I think there's... Well, I, I think you obviously... I think, again, just the kind of inherent curiosity people have leads you to go down things like caves and then... I mean... 
when I was younger, the way I ended up finding out about things like the Nether was through the achievement system and like, oh, there's this all mm. this other stuff, and then you, <laughs> you kind of get curious. Like you said with the, the tree, you cut you cut it down, then it 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 just floats, and you're like, well, if that's what that's like, then what else is this game hiding from me that, that's gonna <laughs> right. freak me out when I find it? And then you just kind of end up you just kind of keep going and then yeah all of a sudden that's you in the end yeah i mean the, i'm not one for when it comes to games i usually like things that are are quite that don't really tell me what to do that's why i've not been a big fan of the more recent pokemon games because they tend to hold your hand a bit mm. too much and I'm like don't don't tell me what to do i'm i'm fine just leave me leave me to my own devices <laughs> game which i think is one of the reasons i like minecraft because it doesn't really give you any specific direction to go in and it doesn't say Oh, you need to go here, and then you need to go here, and you need to get this. You know, you might end up looking it up and see, like, oh, well, I need, you know, this amount of wood to make this thing, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, normally that's something that comes from you. That's not something that comes from the game telling you that you need to get X, Y, Z. Um, but obviously, it's like, oh, well, if you want to get to the nether, then you need to get a portal. And you're like, well, there's this other world? Oh, well, I'm going to go do that. <laughs> It's not necessarily the game's game saying, oh, well, you need to get there so you can do this and this, and this is what we want yeah. you to do first. You know, for ages, you can just wander around by yourself and build stuff. One of my most earliest worlds in Minecraft was just, I built a house, and then I, I got lost. So then just I built another whole town just because I was bored. <laughs> and then I never ended up doing anything else. And you can do that if you want. You can just be happy sitting at square one of the story, or you can go through the whole thing, or you can yeah. be somewhere in between. Um, now, did you actually lose where that first house was, or were you able to find it again? Well, actually, it's interesting, because that was the very first world that I ever made on Minecraft, and that was back in 2011. And at the time, I had a, a crappy little netbook, which my dad got me, and it was had an Intel <laughs> Atom inside it, and like one gigabyte of RAM. So I had to keep the setting of the render distance on the lowest setting possible. So it was like a, like a five meter radius. It was just all mist. Oh my so gosh. So I ended up getting lost from my house because in fact, when I, I just before I, I threw the computer out recently to get it recycled. So I, I found this old world because even though I deleted Minecraft, like the, <laughs> the app data uh -huh. folder was still there. Yeah, so I managed to take it and I, I got it on my, my proper desktop that I have now. And I actually went and I was looking around and I found the original house that I built. <laughs> and as it turns out, like it was like a hundred meters away from where I got lost. Cause then I wandered into this forest and I thought, I, I, and there's all these little stubs of trees. And I thought, uh -huh. oh, I remember what happened. And what happened was I got lost and I thought it's dark. I'll use a, a flint and steel to light the ground so I can get some light. I burnt down this entire forest. And then that's when <laughs> 11 year old me just gave up and like, okay, I'm just gonna go and find somewhere else to, to, to build a house and as it turns out looking on a map if the the house that I ended up building was right in the center of this map the original house which I got lost from was just on the corner of this map so it was like a negligible distance that over <laughs> 10 years I was not able to find my way back because of this crappy computer and then that's yeah. that's amazing though that's but I, I finally like, found it and it, it was so surreal to go back in after 10 years and actually yeah. find it because I I could finally turn my render distance all the way up. <laughs> Your rendering limitations created an unintentional game mechanic, a really aggressive fog of war. Yeah, essentially, it was, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I don't think I've ever heard a story like that. It's, I think it's things like that which make Minecraft more interesting, because... Absolutely. Just the, it's essentially the player's own stupidity sometimes that leads to all these amusing situations. Right. And in my but case, my so crappy fun, hardware. Though. Right. That created an element of difficulty that probably not many people, or maybe no one else, experienced with the game. Yeah, I mean, I doubt I, many people would want to use the tiny render distance if they, if they had the option to, to right. use something else. However, you could probably suggest that as a mode. I think Hardcore so. I think actually now I yeah. might try that again and do something like yeah. that because it was actually quite interesting. Yeah. Hardcore survival Minecraft render distance minimum. Yeah. <laughs> uh. I don't know. I'd like to see it. Yeah. Well, it's given me an idea now. Well, if I did, if I did Let's Plays more often, that could be something I could do. Hey, I'm looking forward to it now. <laughs> I, I half expect it from well, you. I suppose I could probably live stream it at some point. <laughs> oh, hey, I'd be there. 
Yeah. You've said it on the internet. Now you have to. Yeah. Do now it. I have it's to. Like There's probably people in the comments demanding <laughs> that I do it now. Yeah. So people from I'm your channel to, yeah. are going to be like, "Hi, Hatsu. Remember when you promised you on always that promised us to do Minecraft?" Channel? <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh. It's one thing you should never do on the internet: make promises, because then people keep chasing you up on them. Or say anything. Yeah. Even hint that forever. you might do something. Yeah. I don't know that too well. I keep making plans for my channel that end up getting delayed. Uh, well, I think we're pretty much wrapping up here. Um, mm. uh, mm, 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 uh, mm, mm, え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、え、
because uh, there's a couple of passages in the in the Torah that tell okay. you that you're not supposed to okay. touch unclean animals either. So it was kind of a right, combination of both. Because there are there are kosher rules that aren't about eating. I know this. Um, yeah. Um, all right, all right. But, it was, but I, I had I, to clarify. Yeah, it was, it, it's something that I need to continue. But it started with. It's, I called it Koshermon because I thought I felt very clever when I came up with that name. But the first one was based on um, what Pokemon. Koshermon's a Digimon, to be fair. <laughs> what Pokemon could be considered kosher to eat? And then the second episode I did was about uh, if you follow the traditional Orthodox Shabbat rules on the Saturday, mm-hmm. uh, what would you be allowed to do in a Pokemon game? So there'd be a limit on how far you could walk. <laughs> You know, what things you could use, because you're not supposed to use... There's an argument about whether you're allowed to use electrical devices or not, so that would mean no Pokeballs, no Pokedex, and it doesn't matter anyways, because you wouldn't be allowed to catch Pokemon because you're not allowed to trap animals on the Sabbath. So there's all that stuff. Didn't didn't the Johto region games include those Pokeballs that you made out of nuts? Yeah, the... So are those natural? Are they not electronic? That is Is a a good question. Is it nature magic? Is that a nature magic Pokeball? I don't know. I, I'm not really sure because I don't think they ever elaborated on the process of how the Pokeball was made, but presumably no, it had some kind at of all. mechanical electrical part. But Gosh, then, and now I'm thinking about that berry juice that Shuckle makes when you give him a berry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a series that I want to continue because eventually, obviously growing up in the Middle East, I want to talk more about Islam in relation to Pokemon because there's a lot of interesting things to unpack there, not only just in a yeah, similar way absolutely. to how I did with the, the dietary rules, but also in the real world with how Pokemon was received in the Middle East, but that video series didn't do so well, and I suspect it was because you talk about oh, religion, no. and then YouTube is like, banned! So, no. I, I'd like more people Too to watch controversial. it. controversial. Yeah, that's the thing, That's <laughs> I think it kind of affected my video views a bit, so I, that's why I want more people to see it, because, you know, it's one of the things I put more work into, and I'd like more people to, to see if they enjoyed it, so, yeah. yeah. I, uh... All right, well, I'll definitely go ahead and put a link to that video at the end of this one. Um, the... Kosher, man. Yeah, I suppose um, more generally, though, you know, everyone knows me for culture bits, so that's another thing I would recommend. If you like learning about culture and games, then you can watch culture bits. That's the one I've done the most videos on, and it's the one that's received the most views on my channel. Uh, like, what, 200 odd thousand views was one of my videos had uh, last, after last yeah. summer. It was one I did about Mario Maker, but yeah, so cool. if that's the kind of thing All you're right. into, then you can check out my channel. I'm sure they're into it. Um, the, gosh, wow, that is a that is a trip to think about. Uh, I'll have to go back and see <laughs> see what you said. Um, I lost my train of thought because of that. Well, I think uh, we were kind of wrapping up, weren't we? That's true. Um, so, anyways, uh, we'll just say thanks to all the people. Thank you again. Mm-hmm. Thank you for having uh, me. And it's lovely to come on and have this chat. <laughs> Absolutely awesome. Um, and if we get a chance in the future, uh, especially if I can in, uh, invade your uh, yeah. absolutely promised Minecraft hard mode uh, uh, live stream, yeah, uh, I'll definitely. definitely be there for that. I mean, um, given the current events, I might be holed up in my house anyways for a, a couple <laughs> weeks, so there's always a yeah. chance that I'll get bored and decide yeah. to live stream. But I mean, I have a lot of stuff planned to talk about philosophy on my channel. I'm sure you can find a way to to get you involved in hey, that as well at some point. If you want to bring me on, bring me on. I'm oh. completely gung-ho. Yeah, once I plan it. That's another thing that I'll start promising to people <laughs> and then I'll forget about. So we'll just have to see how things Awesome. Go. All right. Well, uh, then to all the viewers, thank you so much for sticking around till the end. Uh, check out Kai Hatsu's channel. Link in the description and in the end cards. And as always, stay true.